Dr. John. Yeah, good morning, Mick. And uh, isn't it a shame that we've had so many people sending in voice messages because we can't retrieve them? Mm, that's and, right. And uh, uh, for anybody out there who's actually sent in a voice message, because we can't retrieve it, please resend it as a text mm. because then we can answer the question. We don't know what it is. Absolutely. So, <laughs> yes. Now, Dr. John, um, uh, this weekend I, uh, I went down to, or last weekend, I went down to the snow. And uh, one of my mates, who he, he likes, you know, looking at rockets and satellites and stuff as much as I do, uh, we were looking at uh, the Starlink as it was going over, and uh, we stopped at Lake George. Sadly, a little bit too cloudy uh, on our way down to check it out, and then uh, again we uh, we went outside to look at the skies at about 7:02, I think it was Friday night. We were meant to get a, a decent view of Starlink. But it was too cloudy again, so we didn't get to see it. But we started talking about satellites. There was a bit of a crew of us there. And uh, interestingly, I found out that, you know, Starlink is, is going to be at about 400 and I think 80 kilometres above the Earth. And it, it's constantly swirling around. There'll be up to 40,000 satellites when Elon Musk has finished his job. But um, then other satellites, which are geostationary satellites... They're at something like 35,000 kilometres up. Now, they have to be that much higher so as they can stay pretty much stationary above us, which I found really interesting. And I thought, wow, I'm looking up. I could be looking at one right now, but it would look more like a star. But then again, it's so far away, it would probably look like a very, very, very faint star. But um, nowadays, with so many satellites up there and so many high satellites you wonder about some of the rocks that fly by, whether they're going to one day take out a satellite. Oh, look, Mick, it's, uh, it's, it's very, very possible. And uh, uh, there was a link uh, I sent you last week about uh, one that whizzed past actually last Thursday night, so four nights ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, you, you mentioned that uh, the uh, uh, um, communication satellites are at about 35,000 k's. Which is not all that far. Uh, well, so for 480 for the Elon Musk communication. Oh, yeah, 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 that's, that's, that, that's uh, much closer. Mm. But look, the moon is uh, 400,000 k's away, mm -hmm. right? So, and the uh, geostationary satellites, the communication satellites, are 35,000 feet, uh, uh, kilometres up. Yep. But uh, uh, if a, um, an asteroid uh, comes between the uh, Earth and the Moon, that's lower than 400,000 k's, mm. then that's usually classified as a fairly near miss. Yeah. Now, the one last Thursday night had only been spotted six days before. Yes. So uh, not much time to uh, take evasive action if it's going to hit. Mm. And that, was at, uh, that came past at 22,000 k's. So that's, that's definitely lower. That, that's than lower than the communication satellites. satellites. And, and to put it in perspective, the distance from Sydney to London is about 20,000 k's. Mm. So about the distance from Sydney to London, mm. that's not far. Yeah, you absolutely. Know, when, when you think that that satellite was uh, the size of a bus, now that's very small, asteroid. actually. Yep. That, you know, that as asteroid, yes, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> the size of a bus, that's pretty small mm. but uh, you'd know you'd been thrown under a bus <laughs> if it hit you <laughs> yeah yeah now i know it takes about 17 hours or so to get to uh, london but i believe something like that would uh, get here in about 17 seconds right uh, it wouldn't take long no they uh, they they travel very very fast but look uh, I, i'm very interested in uh, in satellites uh, sorry Asteroids. Why have I got satellites on my brain? It's because so I started talking because about of it. you, Mick. Yeah. <laughs> but look, um, the, one of the reasons why I'm interested is, uh, and particularly the close calls, is uh, I had an argument with uh, a friend of mine. You obviously had a discussion last week with a few of your <laughs> yes. mates as well. But uh, this guy was uh, was ridiculing what the uh, the Bible says about what will happen at the uh, time of the end when Jesus returns. Mm -hmm. And uh, the thing that he was laughing at was what the, uh, the Bible says about the stars falling from heaven. Mm. He said, oh, come on, you know, stars falling from heaven. How foolish is that? Yeah. But look, uh, what we, uh, we, we don't realise is that the, uh, the Greek word for star is aster. So when the Bible talks about stars, it's talking about asters. Mm. And we get our word asteroid 
meaning something like a star from that Greek word star. Yes. And if you saw them falling from heaven, you know, coming to earth, that's exactly what it would look like. Yeah. It would look like the stars falling from heaven. And, uh, uh, I mean, earth often goes through those meteor showers and so on. And uh, I think at the time of the end, what we're going to get is a whole lot of asteroids coming down and looking like the stars falling from heaven. Yes. So I think what the Bible says is pretty accurate. Mm-hmm. There's more and more of them happening all the time. And uh, yeah, close calls without anyone even knowing that they're there. Of course, there was also one last week that they said was spinning around and uh, heading our way. And it was going to do a, a couple of rotations around the Earth, or at least one, and then a sort of a weird spin-off. Um, they said this one was actually, or definitely, uh, created by, uh, well, smart beings. Yes. Um, oh, right, yeah, OK. They believe it came from one of our rockets that went astray in 1966. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, it probably was a partly smart being, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, look... But, but the uh, the interesting thing about the asteroids, Mick, is that um, uh, we don't know most of them are coming. Mm. A lot of the big ones have got their eye on, but uh, most of them, the ones that whiz by like this last one, are picked up by amateur astronomers and only a day or two before uh, they appear. So, yeah. you know, you don't get much warning. No, and they say it could be catastrophic if they actually strike the Earth, come straight in rather than at an angle and burn or, you know, just sort of miss. So, yeah, there you go. Scary times, and uh, it is written in the Bible. It is 17 minutes past eight. We're with Dr. John from Creation Ministries International. Please send your questions through for Dr. John, 0401. We're with Dr. John from Creation Ministries International. We've been talking about asteroids and what is going to come in the end times. Yes, the stars falling from the sky. We also had a question last week, Dr. John, in regards to uh, uh, Christians, you know, asking how we can demonstrate the existence of the Antichrist and his agents. Um, yeah, interesting question that relates to the end times. It, it does, Mick. Uh, not the sort of thing that uh, we commonly talk about on this uh, this program. Mm. But at Creation Ministries, we are particularly interested in what, in what the Bible says. Mm. And most of Creation Ministries' beliefs come from exactly that. You know, we look at what the uh, the Bible says, and uh, and we see that as uh, God's means of communicating with us. And uh, He tells us what He did and what's to come. And uh, we're to uh, do the best we can in interpreting that uh, accurately. Mm. A lot of it is uh, is very, very straightforward. Some of it uh, perhaps not so straightforward. And uh, this particular bit about uh, the Antichrist is probably one of the ones that's not quite as straightforward mm -hmm. because the, uh, the main uh, biblical writer who talks about Antichrist is uh, the Apostle John. Yes. In uh, uh, his first two letters, uh, one John and uh, and two John, and he mentions it uh, quite a bit. Now, uh, most scholars, who, when they read John's letters, uh, they think that John was uh, writing them to counter the Gnostic heresy. The Gnostics were a group of people who felt they had uh, special knowledge, mm -hmm. and uh, one of the things that they were very much against is. Uh, the material world. They felt that the, the material world was, uh, was something evil. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the things that John talks about is uh, the, those people who had an antichrist spirit were the ones who didn't acknowledge that uh, Jesus had actually come in the flesh. Mm -hmm. You know, because they thought the material world was something evil, they couldn't uh, accept that... Uh, you know uh, the Messiah, the, uh, the the Christ, would come as a human being because that was uh, uh, contrary to what they uh, they believed. So that seems to be what uh, John was talking about when he uses that term antichrist. Yep. But it seems to have taken on a uh, a, a different uh, meaning in modern Christianity, where uh, where people talk about antichrist now. Uh, they're, they're talking about uh, a, uh, a Satan-inspired person who's going to appear on the scene in the, uh, the last day of the, our world. Mm. Now, the expression Antichrist is not actually used for that. Uh, they derive that belief from 
uh, a comment in uh, 2 Thessalonians talking about a man of lawlessness. Mm -hmm. And that's usually uh, personified as uh, referring to a person. Now, when it's used in, uh, in 2 Thessalonians, I don't necessarily think that uh, it has to be a person. It could be just a, uh, a, a trend in humanity that uh, we're believing uh, lawlessly, uh, you know, getting rid of the Ten Commandments and the Law of Moses and all of that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. But uh, people are probably on a bit more solid ground when they, uh, they believe that this individual is uh, spoken of in uh, Daniel chapter 7, where it talks about a little horn that appears, mm -hmm. or in uh, Revelation chapter 13, where it talks about a, uh, a second beast uh, that is usually referred to as the false prophet. Mm -hmm. And uh, these individuals are often seen as being a... Uh, uh, charismatic world leader who's uh, going to appear at the uh, the end time. Yep. Now, uh, uh, I mean, lots of Christians have got different views about those passages anyway. Yep. But uh, uh, if it uh, if it is true that it's a charismatic person who appears on the scene, then uh, uh, you you would expect that uh, one of the, the world leaders who's known uh, now would be one of those people. And it's pretty hard to identify anybody who would uh, fit that picture amongst world leaders at present. Mm. I mean, if the people who see it as a person are correct and if they also see the things that are happening in our modern day as being, uh, you know, indicators that uh, this person is on the scene, mm. then you'd imagine that uh, we'd be able to uh, pick one of the world leaders and say, you know, it looks like uh, it could be that person. But yeah. uh, I don't really think that there's anybody on the uh, horizon who fits that description. Mm. So, look, you know, uh, it's a, uh, we're living in a, a, a very difficult time uh, none of us have got a really clear picture of exactly what is uh, is happening, so it's really uh, time to have our relationship with God very, very secure, and we do that by our faith and trust in the Lord Jesus. Absolutely, keep reading that word. You're on ninety four Studio from Creation Ministries International. We've had an interesting chat this morning, and uh, Dr. John, we're talking about sort of some of the end times stuff. Uh, I've got to say, and I know I've said it before, um, you know, things like revelations, I've found it a little bit difficult in the past to understand some of the things written in the Bible. Look, um, Mick, it really is um, quite difficult, and uh, because we're living in this uh, time in history where, where a lot of us can see some of these things coming to pass in our day, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I can, can't emphasise too much how important it is to have our salvation based securely on the promises of God through uh, through Jesus, you know we uh, uh, it's no time for Christian complacency. You know mm. we we need to be dedicated and diligent like uh, never before. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I was thinking about that uh, Antichrist question, I, I was thinking about uh, how it's sometimes difficult to interpret the uh, scripture because. We approach it with uh, 21st century culture, mm. and uh, that's not the same as the culture uh, in which some of these uh, Bible accounts were written. Mm. And, uh, I mean, around us we've had newspapers for a couple of hundred years, and uh, we're used to reading about an event in uh, the newspaper that's uh, chronological, sequential, you know, mm. uh, one thing follows another. And, uh, but... The, the Bible writers didn't always do it that way. Mm. And uh, I think one of the, uh, the classic examples is uh, what we find in 1 Samuel about the story of David. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, we know who, who David was. He was, uh, uh, you know, he had seven brothers and uh, he was the youngest and he used to be out there in the field keeping the sheep. And uh, no doubt, uh, he, because we know he was a bit of a musician and wrote a lot of the, the psalms, he had a little harp and he'd obviously be out there under the stars strumming away to himself and uh, writing songs and worshipping God. You know, he, mm -hmm. was, uh, he was great at that. And, uh, and then we find that uh, 
Samuel tells Saul that uh, God doesn't want him to be king anymore and he comes and uh, sees all of Jesse's sons and uh, finally anoints David, the uh, the youngest, as the next king of Israel. Mm-hmm. And then we find that uh, Saul gets a uh, troubled by an evil spirit and uh, so they said, here's this young kid, David, who's uh, pretty good on the harp, uh, let him come and play some music uh, for you. So he used to go to uh, Saul's palace and play music for the king and uh, the troublesome spirit would be quieted. Mm. And then the uh, the next chapter goes on to the story about uh, David and Goliath and how he uh, slays Goliath and uh, Saul offers him his armour but uh, he doesn't take it, it won't fit and so on. So he kills Goliath. But then straight after that... Um, Saul is uh, making some inquiries about who was this guy who <laughs> killed Goliath. Mm. Now, not only did he know him as the musician who'd been uh, playing the harp for him, he also offered his, him his armour, but it seems as though after that he didn't know who he was. Mm-hmm. And even when David is having a uh, discussion with some of the, uh, the soldiers there lined up uh, against the Philistines, some of the things that they say to him don't really seem to be in proper chronological order. It all seems yeah. a bit disjointed. And so when we come to scriptures like uh, Matthew 24 and Luke 21, where Jesus is talking about uh, the time of the end, mm-hmm. first of all, he, uh, uh, the disciples said, have a look at the temple, what a fantastic building it is. And Jesus says, well, look, you know, I'm telling you, it's going to be destroyed. Not one stone is going to be left upon another. Mm -hmm. And uh, then they say to him, well, uh, when's all this going to happen? And uh, what about uh, when you uh, return again the second time? Mm -hmm. And Jesus then goes and answers uh, both of those questions. But it's a bit mixed up in the way he answers them. He answers both of them in in some detail. Mm -hmm. But... It's often difficult when we're reading about it to know which of those events he's talking about, yes. you know, because we approach it with, with um, <clears throat> you know, 21st century uh, thinking mm. and uh, they didn't necessarily write things in chronological sequence in the Bible like we would expect them to now. Mm. So there's some of the things that uh, we really need to take into account when we read the scriptures. We've got to be careful that we're not reading them through our 21st century culture when they are written in a culture that was a little bit different than that. Yeah, absolutely. So, so yeah, it's a, it, it, look, uh, the Bible's a, a wonderful book and the answers are there and the uh, events are there, but that's why we can't be too dogmatic about exactly what's going to follow, uh, what's coming next, you know, all of these things. Mm. We've got to be very, very careful. And uh, it is open to some interpretation and lots of uh, dedicated Christians have got different views. Mm, absolutely. I've got to say, Dr. John, I, I think I've got to know you pretty well over the last few years, speaking to you in here every Tuesday. But if you went outside and slayed a giant, I reckon I'd be asking people, who is this man? <laughs> <laughs> You're Very on 94.9 this morning. It is 16 minutes to nine. We'll be back with Dr. John shortly. Please send your questions, 401-949-949. And we're also talking about stuff in the news over the last week. And Dr. John, uh, there was quite a few different uh, websites and uh, publications talking about life on Venus, I believe. Uh, they were talking about life all over the place, but Venus, what an interesting place for life. Yeah. I mean, that was a, uh, a, in the news for a couple of days, wasn't it, Mick? Mm. And, uh, it just goes to show how the, uh, the media will beat up uh, any sort of a story. You know, mm. uh, life discovered on Venus, that's, uh, <laughs> that's uh, pretty good going. Yep. But look, Venus is a, uh, a very interesting planet. It's uh, a similar size to Earth, but it's very, very different. And uh, it's much closer to the sun, and uh, uh, it's believed that the uh, surface would be extremely hot. Mm. But, you know, Venus is is very interesting because it rotates in a reverse direction. Mm. You know, uh, Earth uh, rotates from east to west, as do uh, most of the other planets. But 
Venus goes the other way, mm-hmm. west to east. <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, try explaining that with a, uh, a big bang, you know, explosion. You know, I, I don't know how you could uh, ever get to something like that. And Uranus bowls along like a ball, you know, but Venus goes the, uh, the other way. It really mm-hmm. is amazing. And uh, we really don't know anything much about the surface of Venus. I mean, Mars, we've got a pretty good idea on because, uh, you know, we've sent the little rovers up there and they've chugged around on the surface. And they've found uh, a lot of red rock. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and we've got a pretty good idea of uh, what the, the Mars surface is because we've seen no video of it. But, but what about this? I mean, all those stories, they've now told us there's life on Venus. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Look, uh, it's shrouded in a cloud that's thought to be mainly carbon dioxide, but... But what they have discovered is um, some evidence of a gas called phosphine. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, on Earth, uh, phosphine can come... It's a nasty gas, very toxic. Um, but uh, on Earth, it comes it can come from biological sources, you know, whereas, I mean, it's, it's everywhere in the uh, solar system anyway and uh, doesn't come from biological sources, uh, just like uh, methane, methane comes from biological sources on Earth but uh, doesn't come from biological sources on some of Jupiter's moons, for example. Right, you're beating around the bush a bit, Dr John. They've found a gas. What about the aliens? <laughs> <laughs> well, they, they think that uh, phosphine gas might show evidence of life. Now, why, right. why would they uh, uh, beat up a, a story like that? Well, the people who uh, put out the story said uh, it really means that Venus needs a much more, a much greater uh, e- exploration and uh, investigation than we've, than we've been currently giving it. Well, maybe it's uh, scientists who are looking for research grants because, you mm-hmm. know, if they could suggest that there might even be alien life on Venus, then, yeah, you know, uh, there might be a few hundred thousand bucks floating around to uh, do some research on it. So they didn't really find any life, they found a gas. They, they, they found a gas. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, the media said it was life on Venus. So, yeah. You know, but look, uh, CMI actually uh, is quite uh, interested in uh, alien life mm. because uh, we're pretty confident that, that uh, there won't ever be any life found on the other planets. And uh, the main reason we have that belief is that, of course, we believe life had to be created, whereas uh, uh, most of the scientists who are investigating these things believe that life had e- has evolved. And even though they know that uh, it would be uh, absolutely miraculous for life to evolve, in fact, how it go- could have happened is not, not known, mm. nevertheless, they believe that since it obviously happened here on Earth, according to their opinion, then uh, it must have happened somewhere out there because there's uh, millions of these uh, Earth-like planets supposedly out there revolving around Earth-like, uh, sun-like stars and things like that. So, mm. yeah. So that's uh, really why uh, they, they believe that life might have uh, come and, uh, elsewhere in the galaxy. But look, I think there are, there are other reasons why uh, that's unlikely. Not that the Bible says it hasn't happened, mm. but we think it's unlikely from a theological perspective because uh, uh, the Bible tells us pretty clearly that man's sin corrupted the entire cosmos. Mm. And in fact, uh, I, I think that's why we're seeing a lot of these asteroids and other break-up things happening because man's sin did corrupt the uh, perfect world that uh, God created yeah. and has caused a whole lot of uh, breakups and things like that. And of course, Creation Ministries International had a, a great movie come out a couple of years ago, Alien Intrusion. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That well, was awesome. Well, it, it was. And, and the point that it's making is that uh, one of the reasons why we don't think there's life elsewhere is because Jesus, the Son of God, came here to earth. Now, if if there was life elsewhere, it's either perfect or it had fallen like earth life and uh, Jesus would have had to go as the Son of God to all of those uh, different uh, mm. planets, you know. And why should they suffer 
problems because of the sin of uh, mankind on earth. It doesn't mm. really make any, uh, any theological sense. So that's one of the reasons why we're, uh, we're pretty sceptical about uh, alien life on other planets. We, we, don't, we don't think that's, uh, that's very feasible. And, uh, I mean, when, it all, when all things get restored... Uh, we read in the Bible that God's going to create a, uh, a new Jerusalem for mankind. Well, what's he going to do for all of the other aliens? How many mm. new Jerusalems <laughs> is he going to have to create? Yeah, well, so, we, all, we, we all share the same one. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> well, well, that'll be interesting. Won't it? it might be a bit like that... Um, uh, that uh, uh, nightclub scene in Star Wars, the first one. <laughs> people from everywhere coming yes. to us. So, yeah, no, we, uh, we think it's pretty unlikely for that reason. Yep, yep. Ah, wow, excellent. Well, please, if you have any questions at all, send them through to us and Dr John can answer them. The text line is 0401 that was really interesting, Dr. John. Thank you for this morning. <laughs> yeah, okay, Mick. Well, look, uh, it, it, it's great to have the questions that uh, really trigger the sort of response that we're, uh, we're able to give. So uh, I'd encourage people, keep texting in those questions. They're, uh, they're really great. Uh, don't send us uh, uh, voice messages because we can't retrieve them and uh, we're getting plenty of them, but please convert them to text and send them to our text line. Yes, and, and I'll be honest, I, I think some of the questions we get are so much better than some of the media we speak about. Like that story, seriously, Life on Venus because they found a gas. It's, uh, it's, uh, I'm pretty sure we can come up with better questions than that to talk about. So, yeah, definitely send them through, 0401-949-949. Thank you, Dr John. Another awesome week, and will we see you next Tuesday? You certainly will, Mick. Excellent. You are on 94.9. It is 4 minutes.